uh, I'm Soam, and this work was uh, done during my PhD dissertation last year, for the last two years, under Marcelo H. Garcia and under co-advisor -adv Paul Fisher. So, so I talked about uh, river bifurcations, and the uh, particular river bifurcations are when the river splits into two. A special case of river bifurcations is when you have one of the main channels continuing along the direction of the it came in, and then there's a side channel which comes in. So this geometry or layout is slightly it's a slight variation of the most general case we always see. So the physics of the phenomena I'm going to talk about today is the Boolean effect. And what I say is the, it's the nonlinear distribution of bed load sediment between lateral and the main channel of stream and river diversion. Now, this definition is based on earlier experiments which has been done over the years. But what I will show you is that it has the, the definition of Boolean effect we, through the simulations and through our results, we have extended it from bed load to even suspended load. So f just for the uninitiated, when sediment moves in water, it travels as bed load, that is along the bed, and some of it also travels in suspension, that is what is called the suspended load. Throughout the talk, I will use uh, this syntax, that is Q and S, Q is the water, total water discharge, which is divided into Q main and Q side, that is the water discharge continuing into the main channel and water discharge in the side channel. S is the total sediment load that is coming into in, through the main channel, which is, gets divided into S main and S side, as the sediment load in the main channel and the side channel. So where does the name come from? One of the first experiments were done in 1926 on a small, on a 30 degree flume. And then uh, what they found was that even though the percentage of flow going into the side channel was 50% or less, the total amount of sediment, total amount of bed load that entered the side channel was almost 90 to 70%. So this phenomena was found to be highly nonlinear. And then what they found was not, not only in the 30 degree case, even for 60, 90, 120, and 150 degree cases, even though the amount of water being divided between the two channels is almost equal, almost 90% of this, 90 to 95% of the sediment was found to enter the side channel. So just to make the point that how nonlinear the effect is, so what I have plotted here is on the y-axis, amount of sediment in the side channel by amount of sediment in the main channel by Q, amount of water going into the side channel by amount of water going into the main channel. And if we fit a linear curve, a, lin a line, it doesn't fit well. And if we fit a power law, this power, the, the, coefficient, the power to which it comes to around 3.19. And it's not just for this particular experiment. There were experiments done over the years which showed that the power value can range anywhere between, is always greater than one. And even for some field cases which came up recently, these values have been found to be really high. So the question is, what is the physics behind it? And before that, what is, what is the motivation? The motivation is, there are a lot of deltas all around the world, and these deltas are suffering from, are going down due to lack of sediment, which is reaching, reaching the end of the delta. So some of the solutions that has been suggested is one of them is basically to create these artificial diversions or channels, which will take water as, as well as sediment from some part of, uh, from the main river to parts of the delta where there is less sediment. So that will help in rebuilding the delta and reclaim the land. Apart from that, there are also other engineering applications that is in rivers, we always have irrigation channels for different purposes. And these channels always have been found to get blocked due to sediment. So understanding this inherent physics will make us uh, make better designs. And also in nature, there are a lot of bifurcations which look like diversions. So understanding this phenomena or the physics behind it will help us uh, make better prediction of the geomorphological evolution of this. <coughs> so uh, the simulations we did uh, uh, for this uh, for the study is uh, we we ranged from bulk Reynolds number of ten to twenty five thousand for uh, for a diversion angle of ninety degrees. So we wanted to st see the effect of the Reynolds number. Uh, the resolution if, for for bulk Reynolds number of ten to seven thousand was as good as for a DNS. 
And then we also did simulations for different flow divisions, that is, uh, not just 50-50, that is, the flow is divided equally between the two channels. The flow was divided 15-85, that is 15% of the flow going into the side channel and 85 to the main channel, and vice versa, and then few other options in between. And then we also did simulations for uh, higher bulk Reynolds number, that is 20,000 and 25,000, and also for different uh, angles. So quickly, this is, uh, we solved the uh, incompressible Navier-Stokes equation, and the, the, re the way I am defining the bulk Reynolds number here is through using the mean streamwise velocity and the depth of the channel as the, as the, velocity, uh, as the velocity and the length scale. The, sim the simulations were done, the CFD simulations were done using NEX uh, 5000, which is a highly scal scalable, incompressible Navier-Stokes solver. And it's used the spectral element method, which combines the accuracy of the spectral methods and the flexibility of the finite element method. Uh, for we use, for in NEC 5000, we use the Lagrangian interpolants with Gauss, Lovato, Legendre quadrature points as the basis function. And uh, for time stepping, we use a third order, uh, a mix of third order backward differencing and extrapolation terms, uh, extrapolation scheme, which is used for the nonlinear term. And the way the LES is set up is uh, it's like a spectral filter. So once we go to a really high Reynolds number and we know that we are not resolving the flow fully, then the spectral filter is used, which is like a, uh, is a, is like a cutoff filter. <coughs> so NEC 5000 already had the flow going on, but it didn't have a Lagrangian particle model. And but because we wanted to model sediment transport, uh, we developed the Lagrangian particle model uh, in NEC. And uh, we basically, this, uh, this is the, for the momentum equation for the particle which we use. So we take into consideration vis viscous drag, the lift, uh, added mass, and the fluid stresses. And what we did was uh, we came up with a novel semi-implicit time, uh, time stepping scheme, which was developed. And this was developed because uh, we wanted to most of the times, Lagrangian particle dynamics are done through explicit time stepping. And what happens is the delta t, or the time step you can use for a stable simulation for these particles depends on your size of the particles or the Stokes number. If your size of the particle is really small, that is delta, uh, then the delta t you have to use is goes, becomes really small. So because we wanted to, in, in nature, the size of sediment varies from a coarse, that is say, somewhere between two millimeter to a very, very fine, that is somewhere bit, uh, to like 10 to the power minus five meters. So when you have to have this range, then we have to have an algorithm which works fine for the whole range. That's why we had to develop this uh, algorithm. More I can discuss later more, de more details about this algorithm. Uh, so quickly about the layout. So in general, uh, this is, we have an inflow and two outflows. And because we want the, the flow to be completely, uh, the boundary layer to be completely formed by the time it reaches the flow of area of interest, so we use some a kind of a recycling boundary condition for 65% of the inflow channel. Uh, our uh, simulations had anywhere between 224 to 242 million uh, mm -hmm. computational points. And say for a bulk Reynolds number of 20,000 case, uh, the Z plus, the, that is the first Z plus of the first point uh, near the boundary was at 0 0.058. So you can see the resolution is as good as DNS in the vertical direction. And in the transverse direction, it's 0 0.65. So that's why I, even the LES is a high resolution LES. So, and uh, obviously these large simulations, we needed uh, blue waters and we scale pretty well on blue waters, not as well as, as we wanted, but uh, we we show uh, we show strong scaling to up to like up to around uh, we show strong scaling up to yeah MP, yeah we show strong scaling up to sixteen thousand three hundred eighty four n by p which is the number of uh, number of computational points by processors so what is causing the bully effect. So what I have here is I have plotted the velocity magnitude at, uh, at four different heights from the bottom. And what you will find is that at 1% and 5% of the height from the bottom, 
almost all the flow is going into the lateral channel. Even though the total flow is being split 50-50, what we find is most of the flow near the bottom is going into the lateral channel. So what is the effect of that? So what we did was then went on, we went on and put the Lagrangian particles. And the, for this case, the particles are such that they are traveling mostly near the bed. And what we find, find is that almost 95% of the particles end up going into the lateral channel and only 5% ends up continuing into the main channel. This matches the experiments pretty well. Another interesting feature is after entering the lateral channel, you want what we can see is the sediment particles uh, go and stick to the left-hand side of the, of the channel. And that, is, that happens because we have taken a cross-section here just after the diversion, and what we find is there's a formation of a secondary circulation. So once the sediment enters, it basically is, is pushed to the left-hand side, and once it gets stuck in the flow separation zone, it remains there for the foreseeable future. So then what we did was, uh, <coughs> for the bulk Reynolds number of 25,000, uh, this is different flow splits, and the velocity magnitude has been plotted at 5% height from the bottom. And 85-15 means 85% of the flow is going into the side channel. So what we find is even for the case when only 35% of the flow is going into the side channel and 65% continues, in, continues into the main channel, the, most of the flow near the bottom goes into the side channel. And this shows up even for different uh, diversion angles and for different uh, bulk Reynolds number. So then the question is, what is causing flow near the bottom to enter the side channel? And can we quantify how much of the flow is entering the ch side channel from each depth? So one of the, uh, I think the, what, what is causing this effect is basically, uh, so what we have plotted here is the uh, hydrodynamic pressure. And what we see here is in the main channel, there is an adverse pressure gradient that is created. And in the lateral channel, there is a favorable pressure gradient. Now, we know that if there's a free surface open channel flow, the flow near the bottom is slower than the flow near the top. So when the flow, the total flow is approaching the diversion, and there is a, a favorable pressure gradient in the direction of the lateral channel and the, and, the, uh, and the adverse pressure gradient in the main channel, but the flow to overcome the adverse pressure gradient, most of the flow has to come from the top because the velocity is higher. And because the inertia of the flow at the bottom or the velocity is lower at the bottom, that all the flow that goes into the lateral channel comes from the bottom. Now, how do we quantify it? So what we did was we took Lagrangian particles, which were very, very fine and buoyant Lagrangian particles. And, what we, what I, and they were uniformly distributed throughout the channel. What we have here is uh, they have been colored according to the distance from the bottom, so more blue the particles are the, are the particles at the bottom, and as it becomes yellow, the particles are away from the bottom. And this is the case in which uh, the bulk Reynolds number of th is 300, so the flow incoming flow is laminar, and it's at the 90 degree uh, diversion, and the total flow is being split 50-50. What we clearly see is almost all the particles which are blue are going into the side channel, and the particles which are yellow are continuing into the main channel. So and this shows up even for the turbulent, the fully turbulent case. So uh, what we can see here is, again, uh, the, most of the blue particles, what you will find is moving into the side channel. And most of the yellow particles, which are near the top, goes into the main channel. Though the effect, is, effect in, a, in the laminar case is slightly more or much more stronger than the, than the turbulent case. But it, the, the thing shows up too. So the question is, can we count? Uh, so what we then ended up with doing was we counted what was happening. So all the particles that were rele uh, released, we, uh, we counted how many of them were from, like we divided the whole thing into 10 bins, and we counted from each bin how many went into the side channel. So what we find here is that for the laminar cases, for the in the first 40% of, of, from the first 40% of the depth from the bottom, almost all the flow, that is almost all the particles, went into the side channel. But in the turbulent case, that number is less, but even then it is, uh, this, the phenomena is pretty strong. The interesting thing is, all the experiments which had been earlier done were done for bed load. 
So that means it was, they thought that all the sediment were moving in the first 10% of the channel. But what we find here is that through the simulations that even particles which are moving away from the bed, but near the bed or say in the first 30 to 40% of the channel will move into the most, will primarily move into the side channel, even though the total flow split is 50-50. Now the question is that what we did was in nature, the incoming sediment has these kind of uh, profiles, uh, these kind of steady profiles. So we use different sediment sizes. And what we found out was, uh, so on the y-axis, I have S side by S, that is total amount of sediment entering the side channel by total incoming sediment, and by Q side by Q. And what we did was we tried different, as I was mentioning, we tried six different sediment sizes, right from something really, really fine that almost moves along with the flow and to up to a much, much coarser, which uh, all the sediment moving as, as bed load. So what we find is with increase in sediment size, the amount, the, the nonlinearity of the phenomenon increases with increase of the sediment size. This is the case of the Burton of number of 7,000 and 25,000. So these are the two turbulent cases. And what we find is uh, in it, I have the bold line here is the is from the experiment, so our data matches, our uh, numerical simulation data matches the experiments pretty well and shows the trend. What we end up then doing was collapsing the two uh, together, and what we found was the parameter which was more important was not the size of the sediment, but the ratio of the particle fall velocity with the shear velocity, which is a non-dimensional parameter. And then what we found was depending on that, uh, higher the, the value, so we call that number as a Rouse number, so how higher the value of Rouse number, higher the nonlinearity of the phenomena. We dug up some old experiments and what we found was, was there was actually an experiment back in 1946 uh, in somebody's MS thesis in which what they had found was something similar, but for different sediment sizes, they saw the, the, the increase in nonlinearity of the phenomena. So. In conclusion, what we found was the Boulier effect. We found the cause of the Boulier effect, that is the flow near the bottom preferentially entering the side channel even when only 35% of the total flow enters the lateral channel. This happens because velocity of the flow near the bottom is relatively low. Thus, when part of the flow in the main channel changes direction, most of the flow comes from the bottom of the channel. For laminar cases, almost 100% of the flow in the first 30 to 40% enters the lateral channel, so the phenomena is much more stronger for laminar flow cases than, than the turbulent flow cases. But even in the turbulent flow cases, almost 60 to 70% of the, of the flow at, at the bottom 30% of the channel enters the lateral channel, even though the total flow is split 50-50. And then we ended up finding that uh, the nonlinearity of the phenomena depends on the Rouse number, that is the ratio of the size of the sediment to, uh, to ratio of the size of the sediment to the shear velocity, which just basically shows how fast the flow is going. And uh, so this is, uh, so we are in communications with Rob Cineros and Mark Van Moer to create anim some better animations for these simulations. And I thank Greg Bauer for responding regularly on uh, questions of proposals of optimizing neck on blue waters. And what I would con quickly do is a shout out that uh, not just that, we are, uh, I am also involved with a few more studies. And so what we are now currently also doing is oxidatory flow, and this is another blue waters uh, proposal, and this is with Rafael Tinoco. And in this one, what we are doing is uh, on trying to understand how flow goes, oxidatory flow goes through an array of in cylinders, and in these, we will go up to 500 million computational points. And then there is this collaboration with uh, people in Leeds in which what we are doing is gravity currents. As you can see, this is the experimental facility. And what we are doing is we are trying to simulate them and then try to learn from it and extend it. So yeah, thanks.